Hello, my name is Fong and I'm the project manager for Minute Maid Consultants. Our team includes Brady as our lead structural engineer, Maria as our lead environmental engineer, Daniel as our lead hydrology engineer, David as our lead pavements engineer, and Gus as our lead transportation engineer. So over these past few months, our team has been working on a design for the Shaw Lane reconstruction and Shaw Lane um, power plant renovation project. MSU is in, in the process of implementing components of its campus master plan. And for the 2020 vision, a new academic building was envisioned at the location of the decommissioned Shaw Lane power plant. The campus master plan suggested renovating the existing building and adding a substantial expansion to the building footprint. Shelling between Chestnut Road and Red Cedar Road will be repaired and also the campus master plan vision is to have North Shelling closed and have South Shelling be two way instead of one way. So the site is located on Mission State's campus on the corner of um, Red Cedar Road and North Shelling. The Shelling power plant was constructed in 1948 and in 1975 it was decommissioned from power production. In 2011, the 239 feet smokestack was removed. On the site is the empty Shawling power plant building and next to that is parking lot 79E. Um, next to that is parking lot 79, Spartan Stadium, Wells Hall. So for this project, MSU wants the new building and the renovations to be architecturally compatible and for the buildings and infrastructure to achieve efficient energy utilization. They also want us to minimize negative impacts to the water quality of the Red Cedar River watershed, and they want a transportation option that will maximize the movement of people and minimize the movement of cars because they want to reduce vehicles miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. This means the design should prioritize pedestrians and bicyclists first and other forms of non-motorized transportation, mass transit, and serv service vehicles last, and also private vehicles last. Um, the design should also try to implement green infrastructure, protect existing, or create new green space, and preserve and protect existing natural areas. Basically, this project is renovating the existing power plant building, adding a substantial expansion to the building footprint and street reconstruction while incorporating elements of sustainable and low impact design and ensuring that all codes, standards, rules, regulations are met. So um, for the interdependency, interdependencies on the project, Brady, our structural engineer, worked a bit with Gus, um, our transportation engineer, to coordinate locations of building entrances to which the sidewalks must lead. He also worked with our environmental engineer, Maria, um, providing details about the building roof for the purpose of installing and maintaining solar panels. Maria is mainly the consultant on the Shawling projects and she has a separate project, but she gave her advice and her expertise throughout the Shawling project. Due, the, to, due to the roads, parking lots, and structures effect on runoff, Daniel, our hydrology engineer, worked closely with our pavements, transportation, and structural engineer. Um, as for David, our pavements engineer, he worked mainly with Gus to get traffic data and design requirements for traffic flow. Um, Gus also had to get his design finalized in order for David to finalize his pavement design quantities and costs. Um, now I will hand it over to Brady. Hello, my name is Brady West and I am the structures expert for this semester's senior design project. So the architectural proposal, the proposal given by the architect originally consists of two rectangular buildings connected by a narrow walkway here. Each building was to have four floors and one basement and the height of the buildings from the ground was to be anywhere between 55 and 65 feet. There was one major problem with this design and that was that Right around this area, there are a lot of underground utility and electrical lines that provide heat and power to Spartan Stadium off in this direction. And it was impractical to either have to relocate those lines or work around them, especially with the building's foundation's basement. 
So the slightly revised design was for these buildings to be reoriented this way. And this avoided all of these lines here, but the drawback is that it intruded on the existing parking lot right here to the west of the existing power plant. So each building was, the, the maximum allowable height of 65 feet off the ground was used so that each room, each floor could have a sufficiently high ceiling and the roof could have um, enough slope to make the snow loads slightly lessened. So the design process consisted of three phases. The first phase was the allocation of the floor space on each floor and basement. The second was the determination of the loads to which the structure would be subjected. And finally, the design of the members to withstand those loads. So for phase one, the owner's requirements are given here in this table. The, each floor had to consist of a number of particular room types that had to be each above a certain minimum area shown here. And this design was also governed by a lot of building codes, primarily IBC 2018 chapters 10 and 30, which had a lot to do with the design dimensions of staircases and elevators. And a lot of these provisions are governed by fire safety. For example, being able to evacuate the building in a minimum amount of time should there be a fire. So here are some details for the floor plan. This is a general schematic of what each floor looks like and the spatial allocation meets each of these constraints here. The first floor of this building consists of, here's a Dean's office, primarily computer labs and some large classrooms and lecture halls, as well as Sparties. The second and third floors are identical in each building. They each have mostly classrooms, medium and large, and a small study space. And finally, the fourth floor has mostly faculty offices as well as the department office and a handful of laboratories here and the faculty lounge. The basement finally contains just some other miscellaneous rooms such as a machine room, a large storage space, some extra laboratories and faculty lounges. Phase one was also largely influenced, by, or it will be in construction, influenced by the permitting process. Uh, the city of East Lansing lists a number of different permits that are required for construction on its website. Some examples are shown here. Some examples for some general construction, such as just tapping the existing sewers and water details, and as well as the building permit itself, and some permits for specific parts of the building construction, such as plumbing, mechanical, and electrical. The second phase involved determining the design loads on the building. There were five different categories considered. Dead loads are mostly the self-weight of the structural members. These are the loads that act permanently on the structure. Live loads largely depend on the building occupancy type, and live loads primarily will consist of the people moving in and out and around the building. A uniform pressure of 10 pounds per square foot was assumed for wind loads on all four sides of the building. And finally, some snow loads and roof live loads were determined. And these loads were all determined using procedures given in ASCE 7, minimum design loads and associated criteria for buildings and other structures. Now AISC, the American Institute of Steel Construction, gives various load combinations to be used for design. And these combinations are there to account for certain design uncertainties, but also extreme events such as natural disasters in which uh, the event of which there might be abnormally large amounts of people congregating in one area, for example. The structural model itself was constructed using SAP 2000, a finite element software. Each of the structural members were drawn up by hand, and then the loads determined from ASCE ASC 7 were assigned to that structure. And finally, this load was, or the, the model was analyzed using the various load combinations given on the previous slide. So here's a few shots of the model. Here's the, each of these blue lines represents a structural member, a steel member. These are the wind loads applied at all the various joints. These two came from the structural analysis. Here we have all the compression forces on the columns and a little bit as well on some bracing members. And this shot shows the bending moments present in the beams caused primarily by their live loads. So once phase two is finished and those design loads were determined, the final step was to design the members to be able to carry those loads. So this table here is the result of phase two. It includes various member types and the maximum amount of load to which they were subjected throughout the building. 
So AISC in its steel construction manual provides very detailed descriptions for how to design the typical members. Each member has its own what are called limit states. These are essentially failure modes, the various different ways in which this member might undergo failure. And so the design primarily consisted of uh, designing a member to be able to withstand the most likely or most critical limit state and then checking that design to ensure that it doesn't fail by any of the other failure modes given in the manual. So the final result of the designs are shown in this table here. Each beam and column was designed using a W or wide flange shape, a nice sturdy section because they have some significant loads here to carry, primarily the columns and this beam. And those were constructed using grade 50 steel. Truss and bracing members have significantly smaller loads relatively to support. And so those were designed using hollow square sections. And those are to be constructed out of A36, which is a slightly less durable, but more inexpensive steel material. And finally, once this was all done, the cost estimate was completed. Um, this was done by computing the quantities of steel and concrete throughout all the structures and then multiplying those by their average or rather conservative market price estimates. Uh, the steel quantities, of course, is the amount of steel that it took to construct the steel skeleton and the concrete is used to uh, construct the, the floors, slabs, and the walls for each building. And finally, some contingencies were added to each of these. For steel, um, the connections were not designed during this phase, so an extra contingency was added to, account to cover the cost of those, as well as the fabrication and erection costs for those steel members. For concrete, the contingencies included the labor cost for pouring and curing the concrete, and also concrete construction is a process that involves a good amount of material waste, so there were some extra contingency contingencies to cover that as well. And this all came out to a final cost of just under $7 million for this building structure itself. <clears throat> now throughout this project, of course, there was lots of interaction between members of various design disciplines. The structures department would normally have had lots of interaction with the geotechnical department. For example, the structures expert providing the weight of the building so that the foundation could be designed and the geotechnical expert providing magnitudes and directions of lateral earth pressures on the underground columns so that the structures department could design those columns accordingly. However, this semester there was not a geotechnical department, but I as the structures expert still had some interaction with other disciplines. For example, I uh, had some cooperation with the environmental expert to come up with designs and amounts of solar panels to be put on the roof. And there was also some interaction with the transportation and hydrology departments. This mainly consisted of sharing the dimensions and specifications of the building footprint, as well as its location relative to the streets and the location of the doors, the entrances for each building so that the transportation expert could design the sidewalks. And that is all I have for you. So at this time, I'm going to transition it over to Gus. Okay, uh, thanks, Brady. Um, so uh, this is Gus. Um, I'm gonna be talking about our transportation, uh, the transportation design portion of our project today. Um, so let's get started. Um, beginning with the, the scope of our transportation project, um, we're looking here at the uh, Campus Land Use Master Plan 2017, which is going to call for the uh, uh, removal or the um, uh, decommissioning of uh, North Shaw Lane um, as an uh, option for through, through traffic. Um, this is going to mean we're going to be redesigning, uh, our, our main focus is going to be on redesigning this intersection here of uh, 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 South Shaw and uh, Red Cedar Road um, to allow for uh, Shaw Lane and South Shaw Lane here to con uh, continue to support uh, through traffic in both east and west directions. Um, South Shaw is currently a one-way road. Um, uh, so that's going to be the main focus of our portion of the project. Um, additionally, on uh, the master plan, uh, you can identify these purple areas here are surface parking lots um, that are scheduled for uh, removal as part of future projects not related directly to our uh, scope. Um, uh, this is a part of the Campus Land Use Master Plan's uh, design objective of reducing the uh, motorized vehicle capacity on um, MSU campus to try and uh, reduce emissions um, and promote alternate forms of uh, modes of transportation. Um, uh, 
the additionally, if you look here, you can see on, on uh, lot 39, there's an area uh, that in another part of the uh, document is designated as a future development site for an academic facility. Um, neither one, uh, the removal of these lots or this academic facility is part of the actual scope of our project. Um, they're worth mentioning because they uh, proximity means that they uh, could uh, be related. Um, so looking here, this is an overview of our general design process. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, how we collected our data. We're going to talk about um, how we analyze the existing intersection, the design of uh, proposed intersection, the design of pedestrian facilities for the intersection for the site, um, and then uh, estimating our costs. Um, so starting with data collection, um, we had two major sources of data provided for this uh, uh, project. Um, during an, uh, a, under normal circumstances, um, part of the initial steps of this project would be uh, going out and collecting uh, current year uh, volume data um, uh, in order to verify that it was accurate to uh, uh, current trends as well as uh, that it was collected accurately. Um, obviously, uh, this year, uh, due to the COVID crisis, um, vehicle volume uh, counts are not going to accurately represent uh, what we anticipate trends to be. Um, so we ended up uh, receiving uh, two sources of external data. So we had the MS2 uh, traffic, uh, historical traffic data provided by the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. Um, and we also had um, uh, peak hour volume turning movement counts um, that were sourced from a MSU uh, uh, traffic study that was conducted in 2019. Um, so we were able to scale those 2019 values to our design year. Um, and so we ended up being able to use them uh, for our analysis. Um, so Next uh, step in the procedure was to uh, perform level of service analysis on the existing intersection. Um, we did this in accordance with the Highway Capacity Manual Standards. Um, using a program uh, called Synchro 6 to model the existing intersection, uh, we were able to determine um, the level of service uh, grades for uh, all, uh, both of the existing intersections for all three of the uh, designated peak hours. Um, as well as for each of the individual movements within those intersections, which you can see down here on the right. Um, the overall level of service grade for both intersections during all peak hours was a level of service B. Um, based on the results of this analysis, um, we ended up uh, devising a, a minimum level of service uh, requirement to uh, meet uh, acceptable standards for our design. Um, the absolute minimum we established was a level of service C uh, for the intersection as a whole and a level of service D for any of the individual movements. Um, those were our minimums, but uh, we were also uh, uh, hoping for uh, a configuration that would uh, uh, approximate the existing uh, volumes. Um, so this is uh, just an example, like an image of the, uh, the synchro model over here of the existing intersection and then some of the inputs and outputs um, uh, of the level of service analysis portion of that software. Um, so uh, next what we wanted to do was identify uh, the major design objectives uh, going forward. Um, so we decided on three general categories of design objective. Um, so beginning with functionality, we basically wanted our design to meet our level of service criteria um, and to serve all uh, vehicles and pedestrians uh, and people using the intersection um, equally. Uh, we also uh, wanted to focus on simplicity in design. So what that meant for us was, uh, was um, creating a design that was intuitive or obvious for uh, uh, users, um, you know, not overly complicated. Um, and then low impact design, uh, it was our third criteria. Um, we, uh, this kind of refers to a couple of different categories of, um, uh, of design criteria. So we wanted to try and reduce our uh, environmental and construction footprint as much as possible. Um, we also wanted to um, do our best to uphold the uh, um, objective within the master plan um, for removing uh, motorized vehicle capacity within the uh, the general area. Um, this is how they justified removing the surface parking lots um, uh, to reduce capacity to promote alternate forms of transit and reduce emissions. Um, so we wanted to try and uh, replicate that in our design as well. Um, 
And then uh, last thing was uh, we wanted to try to avoid encroachment as much as possible on existing surrounding facilities, as well as on uh, areas that were designated within the master plan for future development, such as the uh, academic facility on lot 39. Um, so next thing we're going to look at here is a couple of the design alternatives that we considered. Um, so this was an option that we considered early on that involved maintaining the west approach of uh, North Shaw and Red Cedar. Um, this design was appealing because it uh, were, may have required less in terms of overall construction because we were maintaining existing facilities, um, but it had some pretty uh, uh, general flaws, the most egregious of which being uh, the level of service being close to the lowest that would have been acceptable for us. Um, and it was also a somewhat impractical uh, design, so it failed in two of our three criteria there, um, or nearly. Um, the, uh, so the next option we, we wanted to consider was uh, an option sort of maximizing capacity. So this would involve widening all four of the major approaches of the intersection. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about this design was that it uh, obviously it met level of service criteria and it was uh, fairly simple and intuitive for uh, uh, motorized vehicles passing through. The biggest drawbacks to this one were in the department of um, uh, low impact design. So we wanted to obviously reduce capacity where possible and we also didn't, uh, expected that widening the four lanes would involve encroachment on the lot uh, 39 uh, academic facility. Um, so this design uh, obviously satisfied the first two criteria, but not as much the third. Um, so then uh, another option we considered briefly was um, a four to three lane conversion. Uh, we were provided information on four to three lane conversions. Um, and uh, we wanted to look into implementing a, a so-called road diet on West Shaw Lane uh, between Chestnut and Red Cedar. Um, this option was appealing because it afforded us the opportunity to install bicycle facilities uh, on the road, um, and it did meet level of service requ uh, requirements and simplicity requ of design requirements. The problems lie elsewhere with this one. Um, it was mainly uh, the level of service uh, effects that this uh, reduction of capacity might have had on the Chestnut intersection uh, seemed like it could be severe. Um, we also were concerned that uh, the four to three lane conversion involves a center left turning lane and the segment of uh, West Shaw that we were looking at only has really one major outlet between those two intersections, uh, the stadium parking lot. And so there really wasn't a high enough uh, left turning volume to justify a center left turn lane there. Um, so we took, um, this, this is what we called our balance design. We took uh, some of the better um, aspects of a lot of our other designs and, uh, and sort of took the best parts of those. Um, and this is close to the design we ended up going with. Um, so we proposed uh, widening the existing South Shaw Lane by one uh, lane there um, to allow for two through movements for westbound traffic, being that it's the highest volume in all three of the peak hours. Um, we also uh, proposed um, uh, widening, obviously, uh, this portion of uh, uh, West Shaw in order to accommodate those through movements. Um, this option afforded us uh, a reasonable level of service um, of uh, at, at least a C in, in all movements um, and uh, uh, helped to control motorized capacity and, and avoid conflicts with uh, uh, the Lot 39 development area. Um, so moving on from the design selection, we, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the design standards we use for our geometric design. Um, the Ashto Green Book is where the majority of our uh, information was based on. Um, we also uh, use the, uh, the MSU IPF uh, design guidelines um, frequently to clarify MSU specific um, uh, uh, design uh, restrictions. Um, and then the, uh, the FHWA, the MUTCD, and the uh, um, uh, Signalized Intersection Informational Guide uh, by the Federal Highway Administration were both very helpful for the uh, design of individual elements of the intersection. Um, so looking at another a specific example for the geometric design of the intersection, um, uh, we in selected a design vehicle of a passenger vehicle but we wanted to uh, make an effort to accommodate uh, the catabuses that are found on MSU campus. Um, so because of that, we, uh, we uh, uh, had to accommodate uh, turning, uh, turning paths from multiple different types of vehicles. So we, uh, using the Ashdo uh, 
turning templates, um, which are found within GeoPack and MicroStation. We were able to design for multiple uh, vehicle turning radii um, uh, uh, adequately. Um, so here's an example of that. We have uh, the turning path of uh, uh, one of the MSU CATA buses here. Um, this is the uh, northwest quadrant of the intersection uh, where it, it ended up being the case that in order to accommodate the buses on this particular turning movement, we had to um, uh, extend our curb radi uh, radius uh, further back than we would have liked. Um, so as a result, uh, we suggested a potential uh, compromise, a, a potential solution of it in installing a channelized right turn pedestrian island at this location. Um, the idea being that it would afford us um, you know, the uh, option to avoid reducing uh, crossing path uh, distances, but at the same time afford uh, larger vehicles the turning radius that they would uh, like to have, as well as um, uh, in improving the uh, approach angle for right turning vehicles. Um, so then here we have another example of, um, this is uh, an example relating to the design of the pedestrian facilities on the site. Um, this is one of our uh, uh, interdependencies on the project with the other engineering disciplines. So um, our structures engineer Brady helped us to devise um, a site plan that included major entrances and exits. Um, and so we devised a plan for pathways that um, provided uh, direct access to all the major entrances from surrounding uh, uh, approach directions. Um, the uh, uh, other thing that's interesting to note here, um, obviously, uh, according to the MSU IPF guidelines, uh, we include a uh, recommended amount of bicycle parking um, for the facilities, as well as uh, accessibility spaces in the parking lot. And all of the curb ramps uh, in the entirety of our design are uh, um, ADA compliant ramps uh, designed with detectable warning surfaces as per the I IPF guidelines. Um, then we want to talk a little bit about the permitting process on this uh, project. Um, there were, there's, there's quite a lot that permitting has to do with con the construction of the, uh, this new intersection. Um, just to name a couple, um, uh, the soil erosion and sedimentation uh, uh, plan will need to be completed for this pro uh, project because uh, we are in proximity to the Red Cedar River. Um, another, uh, another interesting sort of uh, uh, policy uh, related. Uh, factoid, uh, the MSU University Zoning Ordinance, um, because this is zoned as an academic district, new buildings have to be set back a minimum of 40 feet from the road. Um, this won't affect the Shaw Lane power plant uh, expansion, but this could have an effect on the development of the Lot 39 academic uh, building um, uh, development. Um, so that was one of the main reasons why we were trying to avoid encroaching on that uh, available area to give them the most available development space. Um, and then, yeah, so moving on from that, um, we just are going to look very quickly at our final design configuration here. Um, uh, implementation uh, based on, again, AFTA standards. Um, we're looking at here the North Shaw Lane uh, still exists in our final design, uh, which is interesting because Though it has been just uh, decommissioned as uh, uh, open to through traffic, um, we're anticipating that it'll still serve uh, well as an access drive um, for the lots, uh, lot 39 and 40 and the other lots uh, scheduled for removal, um, as well as for commercial and emergency vehicles for these buildings. Um, so we're thinking that the removal of North Shell Lane and conversion to green space can be done in concurrence with the development project for those lots. Um, so then we're looking here at our, our cost estimate. Um, so uh, because our pavement uh, specialist included in, in their cost estimate a lot of uh, um, the majority of the uh, uh, cost of paving materials, our cost estimate was focused more on uh, removal and construction items like, um, like sidewalk removal and tr uh, uh, tree removal and uh, removal of existing signals and things like, or uh, not signals, um, uh, uh, like grading um, and movement of traffic items was our second major category. So um, uh, obviously we had our, our installation of new traffic signals and signs. Um, and then we had uh, our example here we can show of our, uh, our pavement marking estimate. So we had uh, longitudinal and uh, uh, longitudinal pavement markings as well as uh, um, uh, overlays. Um, 
And then we also included contingencies for this project, estimate of minor traffic devices and co for contractor staking, staking for the road improvements, um, bringing this to be our total estimate. Um, and then to talk more about the pavement uh, design process, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to David. Uh, so thank you. Okay, thanks Gus. So the scope included the improvement of Shaw Lane and Red Cedar Road, uh, and we actually decided to reconstruct the uh, parking lot 79 adjacent to the building there. So the activities will, will include widening, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and then uh, really anything else that falls into the project uh, along the way. Four alternatives will be provided. I'll have a new flexible, a new rigid, um, a mill and fill design, and an overlay. So the design timelines here, it's listed in chronological order. We got UTC site exploration, and then on down the line, you got your cost estimates, your life cycle cost, uh, your final design, and then overall cost. So for site exploration here, you can see on the left, Shaw Lane there, on the right, Red Cedar. Shaw Lane's in a little bit worse condition. So you can see the transverse cracking and the alligator cracking along the road there, and then Red Cedar is actually in pretty good condition. Um, so you can already see that the rehabilitation process is going to be a little more uh, in-depth for Shaw Lane rather than Red Cedar. So part of the site exploration was getting the soil boring logs to develop the uh, resilient modulus of the subgrade. Um, it was generally the sandy clay material down there, and typically that's in between three and 4,000 PSI, so we used a 3,500 PSI for the design resilient modulus. Then you need your climate data. We used LTPP bind to determine that and get the PG grade uh, that we're going to be using for the asphalt. Um, and LTPP bind, you can actually just select East Lansing and it uh, gives you all the temperature data and everything like that. And then with a few other things input into the program, spit us out a, uh, a PG grade of 58 minus 28. So then we gotta, you got to take a look at the local, state, and federal regulations. Uh, we use that book there on the, the left hand side, it's procedures and guidelines for developing public roads, and that's developed by uh, Ingham County. Uh, <clears throat> and so the design is going to meet all the MDOT specifications and standards, so everything in that 2012 book. Uh, and then the design needs to be reviewed and approved by the county engineer. And then when it comes to permits, there needs to be a permit uh, before you start work within the right of way, and that's on the contractor to get that, and he can, uh, he can attain that free of charge uh, before he starts work. Uh, the driveways need to be inspected um, and permitted. It, permitted. Uh, don't foresee any driveways needing any reconstruction, so I'm not sure that's going to uh, come into play here. So here's uh, a couple, here's a table and a diagram that's included in that book. You got your typical cross section over there that's going to be following throughout the project. And then on the right hand side there, the typical widths and depths of the pavement, we're going to be using the heavy residential section uh, just due to the amount of traffic on MSU's campus. And then you got the buses rolling around quite a bit too. So heavy residential is what we're using. This was uh, gathered from infrastructure planning facilities for MSU. This is the parking lot cross section. Uh, you got your, you know, your, your, your base, sub base, the <clears throat> base course of the asphalt, top course of the asphalt there, 13A, 36A. And so that's what we're going to be following for the parking lot. Now I want to mention another design alternative here for uh, the parking lot would be permeable pavement. But IPF has had problems with that in the past, uh, has to do with like maintenance issues and things like that. So they're trying to stay away from permeable pavement, so we won't go with that. So I need to figure out the traffic demand. This was uh, one of the interdependencies uh, throughout the project here. We uh, determined the traffic along the roads with, I, I got with the transportation engineer and uh, we used MS2 traffic count data system there. And it actually just lists the AADTs on each road on MSU's campus there. So with that, we can get the 20-year easel calculations. Uh, the percent trucks come from the buses that are going to be um, on campus. That growth factor came uh, from the growth factor equation using a 3% growth rate. Truck factor for flexible and rigid, that's from MDOT, directional distribution, lane distribution um, as well. Then you got your easels there on the right-hand side in millions. So your design alternatives, first you need your structural numbers, your structural numbers of the existing and your design structural numbers. There I have the coefficients listed. Um, the existing structural numbers uh, were gathered using the site data, those pictures that I showed when you go and uh, do your site exploration. And I'll show you on the next page, uh, kind of what the process is for getting those coefficients. 
So I used the greater than 10% high severity alligator tracking. I'll mention this is for, for Sha Lane here, just as an example of how I use this chart um, for the AC surface. And then you've got your stabilized base. Uh, and then there was no evidence of pumping or degradation there that showed any contamination of fines. And then those coefficients on the right hand side, I kind of just took the middle number as a, as a good estimate for what the existing coefficient was going to be. And then I summarized my preliminary data. I included Shaw Lane as one just because we're eliminating the North Shaw Lane and making it a two way street on South Shaw Lane here. So the, the, the easels are in, included, both AADTs were included there to get the, the 20 year easels. Then you got your designs here. This is all done in Pave Express. You input all that preliminary data and Pave Express spits out, you know, what your thickness needs to be for each uh, design alternative. And here's some examples of that. You can see here we got a, a mill and fill on both Red Cedar and Shaw. So we're take, taking out three inches of asphalt, putting back three inches on Red Cedar. Shaw Lane wants us, well, we want to take out all of it just because of the, the severity of the cracking and the deterioration of the road. But it tells us to put back six inches. We think there's only five inches there, but ultimately we're gonna, we're gonna mill down to full depth of the AC uh, asphalt surface and then put back what we took out. And then there's another couple examples of the, the new flexible and new rigid there. So I mentioned parking lot 79. <clears throat> uh, that's going to be a full depth of excavation because some of it actually does need to be taken out for the foundation for the uh, additions there. And then I've got the calculations on the, uh, the side there for all that work. So then we get into our cost estimates. And all that information was taken from the MDOT 2020 average unit prices there. And to get the uh, cost per lane mile down there on the bottom, it was just all the work involved with, you know, the new flexible, new rigid, mill and fill, taking those types of, taking that type of work into account and then calculating the final uh, cost per lane mile. Here's parking lot 79 cost uh, uh, breakdown. So you can see your excavation and then following that uh, typical cross section from IPF, um, I used those, uh, that data to get those numbers. So then we go on to our life cycle cost analysis. Here I have both Red Cedar and Shaw Lane separately done. Uh, you can see here that your asphalt overlay with cold milling is, is, uh, is the most cost effective. The EAUC, that's your average unit price per year that you're going to be spending on this design. Obviously Shaw requires a little bit more work, so it's a little bit more expensive. Now, in the places that we're going to be expand, you know, widening the road for the dedicated turn lane on, on Shaw Lane that we're putting in, and then the dedicated right-hand turn lane coming from the north on Red Cedar, those are going to be a new flexible design since that's the second um, most cost-effective, and it just really wouldn't make sense to use anything other if we're just, you know, keeping with the uh, flexible pavement. Anyway, and I do want to mention here that uh, the reason an overlay uh, alternative wasn't included in the life cycle cost analysis is because it was deemed impractical. Obviously with an overlay you're adding asphalt and then that's going to throw off the profile of the road and because it's all bound by curb and gutter it just it wouldn't have made sense to either raise the curb and gutter or completely tear it out and put all new stuff in it just wouldn't have been cost, cost effective so that's why it was uh, not considered here. Okay, then here we have our final design cost. Uh, you can see the total length of the project is 0.73 miles. Each road is split up um, into smaller portions just because of the different lane configurations we wanted to get uh, as close to um, the exact estimate as we possibly could. Uh, so with a 15% contingency uh, for the project, uh, we're right around $450,000. And with that, I'll pass it off to hydrology. All right, thanks, David. Uh, the goal of the hydrology design is to match the pre-development stormwater runoff to the post-development runoff in terms of quantity and quality. The design must be able to prevent frequent flooding associated with 10-year events as well as major stormwater events such as 100-year floods. The design must negate any impact of proposed infrastructure on water runoff, quantity, and quality. The system must incorporate low-impact development practices 
be cost effective, aesthetically pleasing, and fit into the general landscape of MSU campus and existing stormwater system. The system must also be capable of being permitted from a regulatory standpoint. The first step of the design timeline is to review the rules and regulations that control stormwater management, including those governing stormwater sewers and detention basin design, or in my case, retention basin design. The next step is to review existing infrastructure, after that runoff calculations, and then the design process with alternatives, followed by the final design and cost estimations. The Eagle Joint Permit covers permit requirements derived from state and federal rules and regulations for construction activities where the land meets the water. Since this project does not meet a body of water, it will not be subject to the Joint Permit, Federal Clean Water Act, or uh, Wetlands Protection Permits. However, this project will be subject to the MPDES program, Rules of Ingham County Drain Commissioner, Ingham County Sediment Control Procedures, and MSU Stormwater Design Standards. In order to update the stormwater system in a practical and cost-effective way, the stormwater system should not replace any infrastructure that is not affected by the project and that is functioning and in good condition. In order to accommodate the runoff from a 10-year storm event, an engineering design for the stormwater sewer system was developed. This was done by performing hydraulic uh, analysis of the um, surface runoff and then calculating the surface runoff flows. All runoff flows were calculated using the rational method. The rational runoff coefficient for each catchment area was calculated using a weighted average of runoff coefficients provided in Table 9 of MSU stormwater design standards. The main hydrology uh, interdependency was incorporating the newly proposed infrastructure into the runoff coefficients and sewer design. Ingham County rules state that for a project area less than 10 acres in size, a, site, uh, a time of concentration of 15 minutes shall be used. Because of this, the rainfall intensity or I was the same throughout the entire project. I was obtained from NOAA.gov precipitation frequency estimates for Michigan. I was found to be 3.54 inches per hour and is based on a 10 year, 15 minute storm event. The 15 minute duration comes from the given time of concentration. For the project, the correction factor is equal to one. Therefore, the peak discharge for any given area is I times A times C, where A is the area in acres and C is the weighted runoff coefficient. The inlet and outlet elevations were chosen based on the parameters provided in Table 12, minimum and maximum slopes for storm sewers. This was done in order to ensure that the slopes as well as the, the pipe velocities were within the given parameters specified by Ingham County rules and MSU stormwater design standards. This process required many iterations. The first iteration was made using an estimated slope based on the parameters. The slope, was the slope that was used was 0 0.004 feet per foot. The slope was used as a conservative minimum, which helps conserve elevation. Multiple iterations were used until all pipe slopes and inlet elevations were known and within the given parameters. Manholes will be spaced no more than 400 feet apart and all stormwater piping must be at least three feet below the surface uh, based on Ingham County rules. The total peak discharge value for the area that a given drainage pipe drains was used as that pipe's flow. These pipe flows were used to determine the necessary pipe diameter for each pipe. This was done using Manning's equation. All stormwater piping used throughout the project will be concrete. The concrete piping has a Manning's N or roughness factor of 0 0.013. For example, the required pipe diameter for outlet pipe A7, the outlet pipe that drains area A7 was calculated by summing all the peak discharges for the areas that outlet, outlet pipe A7 drains. This includes all A subcatchment areas except area A10, which drains directly into the retention pond. 
This total peak discharge was then plugged into the Manning's equation to calculate the required pipe diameter for outlet pipe A7. This process was continued throughout the entire sewer system until only 12 inch pipe diameters were required, as it is the minimum pipe diameter that can be used based on Ingham County rules. Uh, the same process was used for areas A or B and C. An outlet is not required for a retention pond as it discharges its water through a combination of infiltration and evapotranspiration. Retention basins naturally filter water through ground soil, improving water quality and replenishing groundwater. Reten retention basins also require much less maintenance than a filter that needs to be cleaned periodically and can often get backed up. Since a retention system is being used instead of a detention system, it must accommodate for two consecutive 100-year, 24-hour floods. The required volume of the retention basins was determined using a formula that was provided by the Ingham County Drain Commissioner. For public safety reasons, the basin side slopes will not be steeper than four foot horizontal to one foot vertical. When considering the basin side slopes, the estimated average depth for ponds number one and two was calculated to be 5.625 and 5.375 respectively. The center depth of the ponds also leaves ample de depth for the drainage pipes to connect. The design of the ponds leaves enough room for traffic and safety with at least four feet of grass surrounding the ponds and one foot of freeboard. The safe space will also provide two to three feet tall shrub barriers these barriers will be replaced around the perimeter of the retention ponds in order to prevent people from falling in, while also allowing runoff to flow into the ponds. In order to help prevent, or in order to help the project meet its overall goals of environmental impact and stormwater management, the project area's green spaces have been optimized with rain gardens comprised of native vegetation. Rain gardens are estimated to soak up 30% more water than typical grass. In addition to reducing runoff through infiltration, the rain gardens will also filter chemical and organic contaminants found in the stormwater. The rain gardens will leave at least three to four feet of room for traffic and safety. Next, we have the design alternative. As you can see, there is a large number of pipes. There is also a lot of super nodes. The final design has been optimized to be more cost effective and saves around $45,000 compared to the alternative. In order to estimate the total costs of the project, some average prices were needed. These prices were obtained from MDOT 2020 weighted average item price report. These prices include the cost of excavation and rain gardens. Uh, the total cost of the project is projected to be a little under 1.2 million. For the life cycle analysis cost, 10% of the total cost is projected or about $120,000 a year. This is based on mowing, trimming, and watering the vegetation, keeping the ponds clear of trash and debris, including periodic removal of sediment buildup, uh, routine maintenance for the sewer pipes, such as monitoring for problems and erosion, and replacing the rain gardens mulch as needed. Uh, that is the end of my portion. Up next is Maria with the environmental portion. Thank you, Daniel. So my individual project was not related to Shaw Lane, but I was able to design some solar panels for the roof. Uh, we were able to fit 1,083 solar panels on the roof, which would cover 27.3% of daily energy usage. And over the 25 year lifespan of the solar panel, the payback period to cover the cost of installation in the battery was 13 years, with a total energy cost savings of over a million dollars. And we chose solar panels to put on the roof instead of a green roof because the maintenance of a green roof on a slope is difficult. So I will now talk about my individual project. 
So the purpose of my research was to monitor the decay of SARS-CoV-2 as it passes through a wastewater system. Many environmental scientists are studying this topic and using it to potentially predict a future outbreak before it becomes an epidemic. So the first step to tracking the virus through wastewater is to detect it. Microbial detection technology like RT-PCR, which stands for real-time polymerase chain reaction and is used to detect specific nucleic acids, making up the virus's RNA, and FSA, which is just injection of bacterial host cells into a sample of wastewater to test for infectivity, has been used, and FSA is a little more accurate. So to track the virus, polyethylene glycol, which is a polymer compound produced by industrial buildings, can be used, and uh, it is injected into a sample of wastewater. The virus is at a present will form a visible layer. Um, this is how the World Health Organization tracked the polio virus through community wastewater systems. So temperature has the highest effect on the decay of the virus. A study that I cited extensively throughout my paper found that at 37 degrees Celsius, the virus decayed fully by 25 days as opposed to 34 days at 4 degrees. Uh, a reason for this was the breakdown of proteins at high temperatures. Uh, you can see this represented in the figure through autoclave, untreated, and tap water. Autoclave wastewater just refers to a decrease in microbial activity. Organic matter also slowed the decay of the virus because organic matter provides kind of like a boat to the virus as they can latch onto this matter, move through the system, and use it to aid in reproduction and replication. So infectivity of the virus was taken out of treated or untreated wastewater. Uh, it is low to none. So no infection resulted when researchers in Italy injected the virus into a bacterial host cell after taking it out of wastewater. So the virus was also detected in wastewater of an airplane and a cruise ship, alerting employees of, of an infected individual and of a potential outbreak. So the trickling filter was the wastewater process assigned to me to simulate. The process uses a biological filter to help trap organic material. And as the wastewater trickles down over this filter, it forms a biofilm made of microorganisms in multiple layers in which organic pollutants become oxidized in those layers. The trickling filter is modeled in SUMO, which is an open source wastewater modeling software that uses Excel, and I was very easily able to edit the code to fit in my viral decay parameters. So flow rate was calculated in a previous design project using a small community. The effect of flow rate on decay of the virus was compared between the peak hourly flow rate, which is the higher number, as compared to the lower number, which is the designed demand flow rate. And viral load inside of these flows are proportional to each other. Decay values show the effect that temperature has on the virus. Decay represents a first order decay per day, and T represents the temperature of the influent water. They were taken from the equation on this slide as cited, and all simulations were run to reach steady state. So the key finding of these simulations was that the trickling filter is not that efficient at removing viruses due to the high microbial activity in the filter, which fostered virus reproduction and replication. Temperature did not have as significant of an effect on the virus because of that uh, as it did in the field study of wastewater samples and even on surfaces. So the effluent concentration of virus at 35 degrees Celsius was only 0.002% less than at 10 degrees, which shows that temperature did not have as much of an effect. Uh, in the figure here, you can see that the effect that temperature did have was shown in the various layers of the filter and how long those layers took to reach steady state. The black line represents the third mic microbial layer of the filter, the third biofilm. It reached steady state of virus concentration at about 15 days, and this is taken at 35 degrees Celsius. At 10 degrees, it took about 27 days 
to reach a steady state virus concentration. A secondary clarifier aided in virus removal, um, effluent of the overall system had about one magnitude less of virus concentration when a secondary clarifier was used to remove solids that came out of the trickling filter. The biggest effect on the virus was optimization of the primary clarifier, which is used to remove the larger solids. And what happens is that the virus kind of connects to these solids. When you remove the solids from the system, the virus is then removed. Flow rate did not have as high of an effect on the virus, either caused by dilution of a larger flow or not. The results were insignificant. Um, the main assumption from this data is that a trickling filter is not the best choice for virus removal. But there can be certain recommendations for how to improve virus removal. So the trickling filter is overall a very sustainable option in wastewater treatment. It removes BOD, which is biological oxygen demand, very well, and it also removes organic matter pretty well. To aid in virus removal, you can add a secondary clarifier, which comes after the trickling filter, or you can optimize the primary clarifier, which comes before the trickling filter, to remove as many solids as possible. You can also add a disinfection unit. So for future research, this is a field known as wastewater epidemiology, and um, technology to track a virus through wastewater can be applied directly to early detection and mitigation of a future epidemic. So I now hand the mic back to Fong to talk about our schedule. Thank you, Maria. For the construction schedule of the Shaolin reconstruction and the Shaolin power plant renovation, we plan to start with a renovation of the power plant first. So beginning December 2020, the construction crew can start clearing out the power plant building. And then um, at the end of March of 2021, the construction of the new STEM building can begin. And then we will wait until 2022 to begin road construction and um, to start placing the pipes and the storm water detention facilities, since we will need to rip up most of the roads to place um, the pipes. Um, once all the sidewalks are constructed, we will begin planting the trees, grass, and the rain garden. Uh, once things get less busy, the solar panels can get installed and then we hope to get the project done by the end of March of 2023. So if you have any questions, you can contact me at my email or you can contact any of my lead engineers. Thank you.